New Rules is part of WeTransfer's ongoing series which aims to demystify the ever-changing landscape of the creative industries, this time the film industry. In this episode, we're diving into film distribution. We aim to answer the question, how can you successfully find your audience while remaining true to your vision? Thanks so much for joining us. In conversation, we have Molly Manning-Walker, director, writer, and hugely talented cinematographer. Her debut feature, How to Have Sex, won the Uncertain Regard Prize at Cannes. Best holiday ever. Janixa Bravo is a director, writer, actress. Janixa has directed two features, Lemon, a critically acclaimed Zola. Fahana Bula is the head of creative at Film 4, where she has overseen projects such as How to Have Sex by Molly Manning Walker and All of Us Strangers by Andrew Haig. And Graham Fulton, the co-founder of Conic Films, the Glasgow-based film distribution company releasing singular independent films to watch in cinemas and at home. There's a distribution problem right now. Independent filmmakers are struggling to get their work seen and the traditional distribution pathways have been upended. What would you say are some of the major new barriers to getting your work into the world? I think standing out in the marketplace. You know, there's at Film 4 we make, uh, we make about four debuts a year and to, to take one of those slots, I think, um, requires... Uh, a really great voice and I think that's one of the things that we're seeing. I mean, you're specifically engaged with distribution. Have you seen a change? I, I think the change has been at an audience level. Well, first of all, ticket prices have gone up and that from a distribution standpoint, especially when theatrical remains the best advertisement for a film, um, it can be extremely risky. So, therefore, there are more films falling through the gaps. I think it's really easy to be pessimistic these days, though, when you look at the box office figures, because it's not just all about what happens at the box office. Um, it, it, it's the long life of the film. You know, this might not do so much at the box office, but down the line, can this make sense? But more importantly, can we find the right audience and build on that audience as well? Yeah, I think like we need to talk about cinema in a different way. We need to for other people to appreciate each other's work and to like, I've just been living in France and everyone's like talking about it in cafes, like, what have you seen? What was the last thing you've seen? If us as like a film, like the film community started that about each other, it would spiral outwards. And I think that we could be more generous as a community. When you're starting a project, should you be already thinking about your audience? I don't really think about that, which maybe is not a good thing. Uh, um, I certainly, at the end of making work, that comes up a lot, and I find that the question of, say, who is the audience? I have a sense of who I believe the audience is or who I would like the audience to be, but when it comes to writing or directing, no, I'm thinking first and foremost how to feed myself and and how to take care of the people that... I've invited into this world building experience. It's how do we take care and nurture the thing we're trying to make and and hoping that it's, you know, not shit. Uh, like that <laughs> takes a lot of energy. So to also be like, will the audience like it? I just, I haven't gotten there yet. It definitely comes up with the people who are paying, right? Like the people who've given you the money to make the thing. I know they're thinking it, they bring it up and it certainly lingers, but, uh, I gotta like turn myself on first. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's just me. That's not like a, I'm not saying that's, that's, the, that's the hard and fast way to do it. It's just the thing that works for me is to nurture myself first. I mean, I would just to add to that, because I think as a financier, we are also thinking about like creative excellence first. And then hopefully if something is really good, then the people will come. Because I think if you're trying to second guess an audience, I'm, I'm not sure that always leads to the most truthful work. I, can feel, um, I feel like you can feel it as an audience member if people are trying to pander to an audience. Um, I think an instinctual so way of working is that it's like, yeah, it's much, much better for everyone. Just what you were both saying, and it, when there's that um, personal story in there that's told with so much love and care, you, 
then as a distributor you're looking at it and identifying the audiences and it sings through you know I, th I think there are a million ways to release a film so therefore I guess it's the distributor's job and I guess the the financiers to start thinking about the audience but yeah. I I think it's going to be much better if it's told from a much more you know the, the director stayed true to their vision it's definitely worth noting that the, the place we're talking from which is to say if you have not made anything yet or if you have no calling card I think that that question the answer to that question is probably slightly different mm -hmm. and I'm reminded of the trying to make my first feature which took five years are you okay mm. and whether or not I wanted to answer the question of who the audience was or if there even was an audience it certainly I realized that a part of selling myself be it true or false was like to you know that was like pushing a narrative right mm -hmm. of like who it was for um, because it would come up because uh, the question of value was also something that hung over hung over the the, the worth of, of the of the piece itself and so I do think that like if somebody out there in the world were watching I do think it's it's not invalid to also have that in your mind because people will ask you that uh, and I think it's part of selling yourself. But it's, it's interesting what you're saying about um, the audience, you know, and, and knowing who you're making something for. Because I think something like How to Have Sex, you would imagine it was made for younger audiences. And but actually, the way the campaign took hold, it was marketed towards uh, cinephile audiences, and then the younger audiences came later. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes the people who you think something is going to be for maybe need a bit more help to get to the film and you need to create a long enough runway to make sure that they will be able to access it at some point in the journey. Yeah. Also, I mean, you can't second guess yes. necessarily who your audience is because yeah. we were thought that it was a younger audience and then we realised that all of those people that went on those holidays <laughs> have grown up and also need this film. So yeah. it was kind of a strange um, evolution of the audience. <laughs> For filmmakers that don't have A24, that don't yeah. have Film4, who can you try and find that can help you navigate? I think it's the whole, um, it's, it's everybody involved, your producer and who are their contacts, you know, do they know distributors, you know, distributors from all different countries, we all speak to each other at the festivals, we're all having drinks and did you like that, did you take that? Okay, interesting, sharing assets, all that kind of stuff. But then they also know sales agents. If you can get a sales agent, uh, they could be very instrumental for um, getting a place in festivals. And then if it's got that festival, then you know, you, you're going to get some deals, most likely. I don't think that's necessarily something you have to, should be thinking about at the beginning of the process. I think what's more important is making something that is important to you, that you feel represents you, that is a story that you think is worth saying in a way that you want to say it. I, I do think that when you're making your first feature, you should be slightly unburdened maybe of some of those commercial considerations, which will come later on in your career once when you want to make bigger budget work and then you know there are going to have to be considerations that are made. But I think when you're making the debut, it does feel like trying to make something that really represents your voice is, is quite important. So who are your best allies in coming up with the plan? Yeah, so MK2 actually financed a bit of the film. Tell me if I'm saying the wrong thing. They, they, yeah. they, so they're the sales agent who put in a bit of money. A yeah. bit of money. Yeah. So then they were kind of around for, f to sell the film very early, yeah. early on. Um, and I guess like that's a complicated thing as well because then they can be a part of the notes process if um, at, at different points. So I guess the more people you get involved, the more feedback you can get. Luckily, for us, it was very smooth. Yeah, we pre-sold it um, at Berlin, so before it went to Cannes, which was for us really great because we went in with a safe. You know, we could really celebrate the film's premiere, mm -hmm. and and it was like a very um, we weren't fighting for the next step in this in the same way talking about distribution companies do you collaborate with the filmmakers yeah absolutely we'll always have uh, an introductory call with filmmakers how much do you want to be involved mm. welcome your input mm. you know we will 
put the artwork in front of the trailer. There's very, uh, very encouraging conversations happen in the negotiation for a film um, from, from our side anyway, where the money's important, but it's not all about that. It's, you know, we put a pitch in for every film as to what we will do for that film for the first few years of its life. Laughing and laughing and running and running and laughing. So it, it, it's finding those partners and making sure that you, you've got a connection and because you, you are going to be working with, and I'm sure that, that must be, I can't imagine what it's like, to how long it takes to make a film and then you get it completed. And you're like, okay, I've now got to work with this other new company and then the press and everything like that. It's, it's such a long, a long process. I've obviously I can speak for you, but I know for myself, I feel a, a very involved in what the life of the piece is once it exists. Uh, I think it's really tough not to be. It feels like it's my DNA, mm -hmm. um, for better or worse. And so, probably for worse, because I'm sure <laughs> my whole mentality is completely irrational. But, uh, but it does. It does feel like um, so completely um, a part of me. You have to believe that the distributor understands your understands you and understands the film, so that they can talk about it and put it out in the world, in 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 a, in a way that you feel represents the work. And what was it about Mubi that did uh, speak to you and make you think this is a great partner? They loved the film. <laughs> they really loved the film. Yeah. They fought for it. I guess they'd had like a good run with Arthur Sun the year before and it felt like a similar kind of audience. Culture vulture. <laughs> That's what they called it. The culture vulture. <laughs> they, that, that was felt like one audience that they knew, they understood. Yeah. I, we really liked the people. The people mm. really liked us. It was a good combination of humans that like were fighting in the right mm. direction, which I think mm. life is about. Mm. I, I imagine that sometimes a film success is very much connected to how the distributor and the filmmaker have like mm. danced about. Like yeah. it's like. Yeah. hearing one another and seeing all of the potential that the film could have because what how you see it and where you imagine it could live might be different and and I'm sure there's lots of overlap but yeah I think the best version of the thing is to be hand in hand our festival is still the place if you want to sell a film and get people excited you won uh, a certain regard the newcomer prize at can and the best award, acceptance award. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so how did Can? I mean, you, the film was already sold, but mm -hmm. did you feel that momentum shift? I mean, we finished the film on the Friday and we went to Cannes on the Tuesday, so there wasn't really, like, a moment where we were, like, sitting on it being, wonder what it is. It was more just like, ah! <laughs> finish, finish, try and get it done. And I tried to go to Cannes with the mindset of, like, let's celebrate this mm. amazing experience that we all had. Everyone felt very connected to the film. The whole cast and crew were like a very tight knit team on it. And we really took it as a moment to celebrate it. And in doing so, I think the pressure was different on it because we were so, everyone was so happy for it to live. And then it got celebrated by an audience, which then made the, uh, you know, the team happier. So it kind of, it had a much more organic thing. Like I was so naive, I didn't even know there was awards in uncertain regard. Yeah. So when and I That's so sweet. <laughs> That's so, even better. So I didn't know there was the possibility of winning awards. And then um, yeah, I obviously left Cannes. And to the point where I didn't think I was getting called back, I packed my passport in the middle of my suitcase because I was going by car. So when we got the call back, it was all very hectic. Breakfast. Ah, breakfast. So premiered at Sundance. Yeah, it did. Are there other benefits from being in that ecosystem? Yeah, I think priorities for me with regards to releasing were that I wanted black people to see the movie because I didn't feel that A24 really had a record of trying to advertise or push their movies to black audiences. So you thought, let's premiere in Utah. Yeah, I was like, this is perfect. <laughs> but it actually really, it spoke to the thing that I meant, right? Yeah. Which I was like, this is awesome to have this movie play on a Friday in the year of the coronavirus. <laughs> this is amazing. Uh, but the, you know, it's like, but the audience for this is, 
this is a confused room, mm -hmm. you know. Um, the movie is, it's black, it's, it's black. The person in the movie, the lead, is black. And I'm also black, and not to say that um, I, I have worked on things that are white um, and can, <laughs> um, or that have white people at the center, but like I felt the, the movie felt, um, it felt like a movie that was also for a black audience and that they had not had a legacy of like pushing movies to black audiences. Like there was a version of a black audience and which is not one thing, just like there isn't one kind of white audience, but we weren't really talking in multitude of what like blackness could look like. I didn't feel like anyone was marketing to them, right? Yeah, that that had just those that with regards to like who I wanted to also see the movie that was that felt really important to me, especially when I was at Sundance and I remember like looking over mm -hmm. the audience and I was like all these old white people, are they okay? Um, <laughs> I'm not like, are they okay? Not, are they okay in life? That's another question. I meant like, are they okay? Is the movie really stressing them out? Like, <laughs> the, the, they, we need to take care of them. This is not okay for their spirits, you know? Um, and when we did, when we finally had the experience of getting to watch the movie in a mixed audience, which happened like a year and a half later, it was so thrilling okay. because there were things that worked for young black people and things that worked for white people and things that like worked for both of them together and like to be in the multiculturality of like what that experience was was like so essential to the the bit of the movie the movie is very much about a relationship between a black and a white woman so like you need like race play in the audience too well i think the can audience like what the can audience was enjoying in how to have sex is probably very different from what like a younger audience watching that film like they would probably laugh at some of the the sort of the banter in a different way to a can audience maybe and when you have different people appreciating different parts it makes that audience aware yeah, totally. of the yeah exactly yeah, yeah. exactly i mean the beauty of the the film festival audience which is not particularly diverse was that it said the film could also do well in this yeah case, which yes. is cool which was like an unclear yes. and it, no one no one knew that yeah. and i was like uh, and it's kind of amazing. Yeah. When it was okay for Salt Lake yeah. City. It was good. That's what I mean. I was yeah. like, it's it's killing in Park Park City. We're gonna be fine. We're gonna be fine. Yeah. It's kind of true because a lot of people were saying to us like, is it can enough? Like they, everyone was trying to like slow it down the whole time. Like kind of take this like the the take your spice out. Take the what wouldn't trans like yeah, which wouldn't necessarily do well for the teenage or make it something yes. else. And actually, when if you feel like yeah, it felt different to, for it to work there because it wasn't meant to work there. Yes, yes, yes. I remember, you know, people saying, for it to work in Cannes, it has to be really poetic. It has to be really, like, and then actually the energy was also part of what made it really fun to experience that film in Cannes. There's kind of an indie aesthetic, if you like. There is certainly, like, a indie patina, soft and blue. It's got, like, a blue hue to it sometimes. <laughs> um, and and a, you, know, you know what I'm talking about. When I see that palette, I'm like, I gotta go. Um, I'm like, I don't know if this one's for me, you guys. But I think that um, that that box of things that we're talking about is, I feel we are outside of that box because I think we're more like yeah. artists. And I also think that in hearing both of you talk, I think you're also very attracted to authorship. Mm -hmm. And a lot of authorship doesn't look like that thing. Mm -hmm. um, though it can a little, mm -hmm. but primarily authorship tends to feel like the individual, yeah. right? can you still sell your films at a festival that seems to have become much more unstable than it was before something happened after the strike which felt like another pandemic we were like a pandemic after a pandemic which i think energetically seemed to have created some kind of shift which you two would yeah. probably be much better at answering but at least it's what i felt from the sidelines uh that there is trepidation around how to sell who wants to watch and, and money just money there's a lot of trepidation and anxiety and pe places want to last and they're losing a lot is how i see it but i know very little <laughs> uh, but i think you're, you're right but certainly just to go back to your your question about can if it's not been at a festival can a film still be sold and it absolutely can i think we, you know, we, we've talked, we've danced around it a little bit about, you know, Jane and Joe Public, because you're at the festivals and it's great because it, it's basically your peers. Mm. And as a film, you've got other filmmakers, you've got critics. You know, they're, they're the ones you want on board early. So it's so important because what it gives you is the, the festival laurels on the poster, 
as simple as that is, it does help um, get a certain audience on board. You get the early critic response. And let's face it, the whole film industry is just everyone taking massive gambles. So if you're, if you're taking something that's already had a good critical response and you've got some people around you saying, this is great, like, OK, I feel a little bit better about <laughs> investing in this. Um, but certainly, other than that, you know, the public don't care about what actually happened at the festivals. Um, it really helps on, on so many levels. But when it comes down to when, you know, a couple going for their date night on a Friday night and they're deciding how they're going to spend... Yes, yeah, yeah, it was £16, pounds, you know, a ticket. What happens there is not really... The, the festivals only matter so much when it comes down to actually the audience that are going to see it. Um, there's been plenty of examples recently of films that have not played big festivals and have found great success. You know, there was a, it was an art documentary last year. It didn't even have distribution. It started screening in a couple of cinemas. Um, the filmmakers were just doing it themselves. Um, it was getting great responses because they built a little bit of that community and audience themselves they actually ended up having to pay a distributor as almost like a service to, to come on and do it and ended up grossing about half a million pounds at the box office over the period of about 12 months. You know, these are, there are exa there's always an audience out there and you, you can never know, we've said it here already, you can't second guess your audience, you never know how big your audience could be. Um, so yeah, there's plenty of examples that you don't really need those festivals, although they really, really help. But that is also a really good point of like festivals being an important launch pad, especially for a debut. And and that is often the first part of connecting with audiences is like launching at a festival and the importance of that. Um, because when you're making a debut film, you're you don't necessarily you're not thinking about audience in the traditional sense. You're thinking about launching yourself as a filmmaker. And so the festivals are often the place where you, you first do that. Can the smaller festivals be useful or can that energy be better used in more kind of innovative strategies? We, we found the, the smaller, more regional festivals really useful because it is more of a public paying audience. Mm -hmm. um, so you can see how, how they're attracted to the film and the programme because there's only, there's not, there's only so much marketing you can do for an early festival screening um, of a small festival, but you see how they're attracted to it, a programme, and then you see in how they react to it, because you usually speak to the festival, how did it go down, you kind of look online and see what the responses are, and, and you try and find that out. So, yeah, absolutely. The explosion of big streaming platforms has upended the distribution model. Sidestepping cinemas, now Netflix is shifting its acquisition priorities away from original cinema. Does it concern you? We are aware of the streamers, but I think the films that, that we've made in the last few years that have done really well at the box office are so singular and authored, like Poor Things, Zone of Interest, all of us, that, that those, are, those are films that could only have been made by those filmmakers. And I think, to me, just, just continues to demonstrate that making very singular work will always stand the test of time. And I think artistic voice expression, creative excellence has to come first because that's what will make sure that cinemas continue to exist and have a reason to exist. I think it's changing all the time. You know, we're still speaking to the streamers for SVOD and almost relating a little bit to what you said. The film's good enough. They are still interested to, to buy it after a theatrical window. You're going to be Hollywood, man. I can feel it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not joking, man. Honestly, this is our time. We've got to use it. The whole world's changing. If it's had that theatrical release, which has had the press reviews, it's been advertised, it's more in the cultural conscience. But to that, so the streaming services, they, they, they almost change their buying habits every six months. I think it's the, the cultural footprint, though, yeah. that, that can be really difficult. Um, films that are released on Netflix are just getting lost. But are there too many films? I, I'm not sure. It's, it's a really difficult one, I think. I think the whole industry is just, it's constantly changing. I want to go to the movies, and I yeah. I want to see my friends' films in the movie yeah. theaters, and 
uh, when places like Netflix or Apple make your movies, you're not always guaranteed a possibility of getting to have a theatrical release. And if you get a theatrical release, it's like for a week or two, and then yeah. it's like on the platform, which is awesome. It is great to have your film have a home where it's going to be seen by people, but there's nothing like being in the theater. There's just nothing like being in the theater with other people. And and um, I'm, I'm myself sitting in the theater and seeing a trailer for something that I didn't even know existed and going, oh, that. Like, I just, I want that thing. I, I when we were like inside for a year, I remember the first time I went to the theater and it was just exciting to like smell someone where I was just like <laughs> looking at them look at it and I was like, wow, wow. I miss that. <laughs> it was like, you know, yeah. like to breathe the same air as someone, like the thrill of that and to, uh, to you know, someone laughs at a thing that you don't think is funny or you think it's so funny and no one else is laughing and you're the, lo the lone laughter in the room. like. That? When something oh, gets really tense and you can feel that energy, oh my it's like gosh. something could like. Yeah. Everyone's like. I even like it when clenched. someone's getting something out of their bag or like you know it's like that. Like, that I don't like. You don't like, want your hands in the even bag. Even if you're like, <laughs> you did that at that moment. Why did you do that at that moment? Like the rapper. The psychology of everyone in this in the in the same room is so interesting. Yeah. I think the other thing is just watching something as the filmmaker intended, and also you know without distractions and. Bold. And just and and I think I think the other thing is just when when you're make, watching things on a streaming platform, there does there comes that point where you sometimes feels like something has been engineered or constructed to hold your attention in in such a way. And I think the beauty of the cinema sometimes is you don't sometimes you just don't, don't know where something's going to go. I'd always fall in love. This is a new feeling. You and me together. I know it was tough that Zola came out in COVID, but I have to say, when it finally came mm. out, it was like Star Wars to us. We were like, Zola, it's finally. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it, was, it came out with like the most massive movies. I was like, we're failing. Uh, <laughs> okay, have, cool. you been yet? have you been yet? Have you been yet? So the, I just want to say, because I think the, 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 the sorts of films that we make, it's always theatrical is like the number one principle. So I don't think, you know, and the kinds of filmmakers that we work with, so whether the streamers are here to disrupt or not, I think that theatrical is always going to be the priority because those are the kinds of filmmakers that we are attracted to and want to work with. So, and I don't think that's going to go away. Um, one of the bright spots has been this kind of flowering of the cu more curated uh, streaming platforms like Mubi, Curzon, BFI. Yeah, absolutely. Mubi are extremely supportive to the film landscape. I mean, obviously they're a commercial company in their own right, but they have Movie Go, which every week, yeah. you know, and that can account for, like, we're talking about that opening weekend, that can really help. If you've got 10 to 15 good London cinemas with a couple of others around the country, BFI player as well, um, for that revenue for those more risky films, for the, the maybe the, the declining broadcast options in the UK are, are able to find a home. Uh, down the line, so no, absolutely, they're um, they're they're really strong, and I think you can just see how um, powerful they can become as well. Finding that audience is the next challenge. Can you speak a little bit to how um, you did try and innovate with Zola to find your audience? Well, the film was based on a on a Twitter story uh, that had been told some years before it and it felt like I found myself like really thinking about how the internet really seems to thrive on how you get things wrong and uh, I don't know if you've have you noticed that you guys outside do you go outside uh, the internet really seems to be fed by how you get things wrong and because this was based on someone's story, their personal account of this event that had happened um, that I, I believe to be true, or at least the way that I chose to make the film was to buy into the story that was told. Uh, the we, we needed to embrace Twitter, whether or not I'm on Twitter. I am not on Twitter, but I felt we needed to embrace like that platform and also uh, allow the audience 
to be the audience or like the, the when I say I'm using audience as like Twitter um, <laughs> uh, to allow them to partake in what their experience was of the film and like allow them to be very loud about how they felt if we got it right or didn't get it right. Uh, I, I'm not sure if that's totally answering your question, but I, I knew we had to go back to home <laughs> to go back to where mm. we where we started yeah. um, and and to not. Though I though I do think in the end the film is is a, is a different experience than what reading the Twitter feed was, but uh, yeah, we kind of needed to embrace the place that we had come from because I I was really aware that uh, people would see where we got it wrong. <laughs> Interesting. With how to have sex, how were you? kind of engaging your viewership? Obviously the cinema campaign was like one of the elements of it and um, mm. but that for me it was really important that we got it into school so we uh, because because that was kind of like the place that it could it felt like it could change people's emo like emotional experience with life um, so we partnered with a charity who actually just hit me up on Instagram and um, they called Schools in Consent Project and they did they started taking it into school so and, and, and that was like a conversation with the distributors because obviously they have to agree yeah. for it to be shown for a very small fee or to, for nothing. And so movie got on board with that, which like I think is quite a rare thing because it's getting shown to a lot of people for not a lot of money. Um, but but it, was, it was a thing that everyone was really fighting to do. It was still the best, the, the most effective um, way to get people to go and see a film was word of mouth, mm. still. Uh, you know, despite all social media and physical campaigning, it, it's word of mouth. So it's trying to get that initial core audience. And that core audience might change a few times in the process as you start to um, roll things out. Because if they can go to see and connect with it, the amount of people they tell that then go and then connect. And then, because we're still, unfortunately, in this model, in most countries where we're looking at that open box office. I am sometimes surprised by the lack of Im imagination yes. mm, that yes. various distributors have totally. when it comes to releasing films. Do you think we have to be more imaginative? I thought Searchlight did an amazing campaign for Poor Things in the UK because it they really embraced um, how the film operated on so many different artistic layers. So, you know, using the costume design and having an exhibition around the costume design, using the um, the production design and featuring it in Arch Digest. Like, I think sort of how it was speaking on all different layers of the cultural spectrum and um, engaging with it as a sort of cultural product. I thought that was a really good campaign. I went to a screening and got a free pastel de nata, which I thought was <laughs> perfect. Neon released Long Legs recently. And you know they they were putting adverts on local newspapers papers with um, phone number for missing people. But people would call it and they would get a message back from Nicholas Cage who was playing Long Legs, and they did a few things like that, and they were getting like a million so cool. people calling it. And yeah, I think in A twenty four. I love the thing they that. did the weekend after it came out, which was like number one after Despicable Me, and I was like, <laughs> yeah. I was like, whoever that is, hire them for yeah. everything. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Um, I was like, I don't even think it's number two, but that's great. Yeah. <laughs> that is great. But I, I do think they do that much better in the US. Maybe it's a cultural thing. I, I don't know if in the US they're more willing, audiences are more willing to kind of more participate, and get play, enjoy, and, yeah. yeah, be taken with it. I feel like the films you're in love with uh, do a really great job of creating these cultural moments. They feel kind of part of the zeitgeist. Do you think that is just in the choosing of the film or is it in the way they are kind of framed after the fact? I think it's I think it's two things. I think it's 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 all well firstly always filmmakers first and filmmakers who are ha are effective communi communicators in the way they tell their stories, but I also think it's a about stories that however specific they are allow people to tap into them in a certain way. So I think all of us strangers watching that film with a live audience, I was just reminded that people have very different ways I'm of experiencing a film. And I was sat next to somebody who, the, who, had, who had lost a parent 
and they were tapping into the the grief in a way that I perhaps didn't even um, yeah. understand about the film in the making of, or watching the film with somebody strong. who had a really difficult experience coming out, out and certain scenes connecting with them in a very, very powerful way because of their experiences. And I think it's, it's always down to the filmmaker being able to communicate their experience to their audience through their filmmaking. Um, but I do think you know, I, I definitely am drawn to stories that are tapping into an experience that people can latch onto in different ways. Is it also part of a filmmaker's responsibility to, you know, articulate beyond their film? I think it is it's sort of tricky territory because actually for some filmmakers, their work has done the talking and actually they don't you know, the, the burden of them having to delve into personal experience um, when they're out promoting the film. I, I sort of question how appropriate that is sometimes as well. And I think, you know, for some, some filmmakers really want to talk about their experience and really want to open up in that way, but not many do. And, and for, for many filmmakers, what it is that they're trying to say is in the work. And I think, I think we do have to be careful about how much we expect artists or filmmakers to draw on personal experience when they're out promoting the work. Yeah, I was just going to say I'm like very grateful for the run that How to Have Sex ha had, but um, as someone who's experienced sexual assault and then had to go out and talk about it in every country around yeah. the world, like relentlessly with the same questions, yeah. and there is a point where you feel like, at first I felt I had to defend... Uh, my point of view on sexual assault and the, and the grey area, and then there was a point where I was like, I do not feel responsible for your opinion anymore because I cannot change and help the situation anymore. And I think that it became too. There was points where I, the work should be able to talk for itself. What about using kind of, uh, executive producers and bring? Mm. Do you have you uh, had experience with that? I think it goes back to what you guys were talking about earlier and the sort of community and culture of cinema. And actually, I don't... I think the US is better at, um, you know, the seasoned filmmakers supporting the emerging filmmakers with their name and helping them. Uh, you know, I think there's just that culture of, like, an experienced filmmaker putting on a screening for a new filmmaker to show their work and inviting all their friends. We do do it here, but I think we could definitely do more of that. Mm. But I think the work we do can be so isolating. Mm -hmm. And the onus is on us to reach back or reach forward, right? I feel when I first started, I felt very alone. And there's still lots of aspects of making that feel incredibly lonely. And when I remember that I know someone else that does the same job <laughs> um, and just reach out to someone, it feels a lot less lonely. But it, there's a, a there's a there's this like gap, this really big gap where I it's not at the forefront of my mind to reach out. And it's because I wasn't reared like that. And I I hope that younger makers are undoing that but it's certainly not how I was brought into this space mm. and uh, I'm trying to change even my own relationship to like how I ask for care mm -hmm. but it wasn't there when I arrived <laughs> yeah I think like me and Charlotte I might feel very lucky to have Charlotte Regan in my life because we grew up together making films and um, and now we have each other and I but I think it's funny because like people often like comment on it but it's also not easy to have those relationships and like to be able to rely on each other and like navigate your own ego in different ways so like it takes work but i think yeah this, the most exciting thing about filmmaking is like community and having people around you it just will take time and work how, how are your feelings about the future i i feel really um i feel excited about the filmmakers that we're working with and so i i and i feel really optimistic about um the new audiences they will bring with them. I think, you know, it would, it would be disingenuous to not recognize that there are a lot of people who are out of work. And I think there are, you know, we are still suffering from 
the um, knock-on effects of the strikes. And, and then I think there is, you know, there is still work to do, but I do think there's some really great, interesting work being made and will continue to be made, and I do think that people want to see that work, and that won't change. <laughs> yeah, every year I go to festivals, and there's always at least two or three films that kind of blow your socks off. And it's not... Sometimes they're rough around the edges, but they, they're just bringing something that makes you excited. Sometimes it can be first-time filmmakers, sometimes it can be filmmaker making their 10th film. Um, so yeah, I think as long as there's always exciting films like that, then there's always going to be an audience and then there's going to be a bright future. Yes, hopeful. <laughs> Mary. Yeah, of course. You're here. Very hopeful you're here. Yeah, that's exciting. <laughs> Make cinema tickets cheaper. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, making things more accessible for yeah. more. Mm -hmm. I mean, is there one uh, piece of advice you wish you'd had? Um, I This is not like a concise piece of advice, but I find, <laughs> um, I find that, uh, you know, you make a thing and then it comes out and then people ask what you're working on next. Next. Oh, oh my God. While you're at the thing. It's so painful. That's come out, right? <laughs> like, you, you were holding an award at Cannes and someone's like, so what are you doing next? And you're like, I'm going to hang myself, yeah. probably. But, um, so, th that space. thing, um, the, the, the space that we're in or, like, where we've arrived at as culture, there's so much, right? Um, there's just so much and I think it's why... Small movies maybe struggle to be seen because there's just so much. There's so much I feel incredibly overwhelmed by how much there is. And um, and I think that I find I start to question if I'm working enough or doing enough mm -hmm. or if there's enough output. And then there are certainly artists that release lots of things and then there are artists that don't release as many things. And, um, and I have to remind myself that some of the people I love don't make that many things and I also love people that make lots of things and that it's okay to exist somewhere in the middle of that um, but I feel um, distressed by the way that people consume the immediacy with which they consume that um, I am not making fast enough to meet the demand and so then it means that I'm behind so the lesson is there isn't one except <laughs> <They're> not behind. <laughs> I think the lesson is is that like you exist where you exist and um, and the pleasure of getting to make and uh, maybe do less comparing of where other people are at and just mm. sort of like examine I guess where you mean to be and if you're there I think we have the best jobs in the world when it's going right and when people enjoy each other's company and when you understand people and and uh, like for me someone asked me the other day why do you make films and I was like it's because of people like you like people's stories you like audiences you like people on crews like you enjoy people's company and you like the world well not necessarily like the world but you you you, you enjoy other people and so I think Try and enjoy other people. Is that a weird thing? No, say? that is <laughs> that is completely true. Because I, for me, the biggest privilege is like getting to work with so many different types of filmmakers and storytellers, and then just learning from so many different people constantly. Like that is just the ultimate privilege. So, I yeah, that's not a there's not a lesson just other than enjoy that experience that you're having at any given time. Thanks so much for joining us and delving into distribution. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for you. having us. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.